Hello, podcast listeners. You are now listening to the Coffee, Health, and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Jordan River, and I want to thank you for tuning in today. Before we get started, please share the Coffee, Health, and Science Podcast with a friend, with a peer, with a colleague. We really appreciate you guys spreading the show. Make sure you're subscribed and give us a good rating and review. We sure do appreciate that, folks. Today, I have a very special guest. So excited to speak to today's guest. I have covered natural farming quite a bit on a couple of my different shows, including this one. And today's guest is truly a natural farming and pest management specialist. So I'm so excited to speak with Mary Beth Sanchez today. How are you doing, Mary Beth? Thank you, Jordan. I'm doing very well today. Thank you. I appreciate you coming on and sharing your awesome knowledge. I'm loving your (laughs) Instagram, all about natural farming and pest control. Really, really cool stuff. Why don't we throw that out right in the beginning here, Mary Beth? Where can people find you on Instagram? Uh, the uh, six letters are M B S I P M. M B S I P M. Mary Beth Sanchez, Integrated Pest Management. It's so great. So great. For my listeners who haven't heard you on my other shows, can you give a brief background on yourself and your farming history? Well, I uh, kind of grew up in farming families. So it's gone back generationally, but of course, they were always using the normal conventional practices, which. Um, in my uh, teen years, I began to study or organic uh, foods and then by extension, organic gardening and got into a different way of growing things. And when I went to college and studied horticulture, I uh, was pleased to see that the college I went to was also leaning in the organic direction and their studies and their uh, classes were, you know, all going for compost teas and things where they Mm. were just really starting to get back into uh, production in those days after, I could say, in recovery from the post-World War uh, one and two farming practices that took us straight down the road to hell. (laughs) (laughs) So You know just what I mean. Exactly. I was just going to say, my listeners have heard, for instance, Chris Trump, the the powerful Chris Trump from Natural Farming, come on this show and talk about how this – you know, we now call traditional farming practice this mm. use of synthetic fertilizers. The, really, the damage <sighs> that it's done to the country, oh. to the soil, to our ag production in general, and now yeah. this resurgence that appears to have started a few decades ago slowly, but is really mm. gaining steam. This regenerative mm. agriculture movement is called yeah. organic farming yeah. movement, natural farming. Does that excite you to see all these <sighs> Instagram accounts and podcasts out there talking about uh. this stuff? Extremely exciting, yeah, because I keep seeing more and more, and so it's not like just a speck here and a speck there. It's like it's almost like a fungus, it's really taking <laughs> off. <laughs> and I know you love fungus, it's wonderful though, because, um, you know, as as you live, you continue to learn, you're never done with studying. And so, I'm always going and watching more podcasts and more videos, etc., trying to keep up with the latest current knowledge. I don't become an uh, antique. But you keep seeing more and more and more people that are, that's, it's just inconceivable to do it any other way. But then the natural organic, say using aquaponics or using uh, the Korean natural or using the uh, compost, compost teas and. Right. Super uh, soil farming and stuff like this. Yeah, exactly. And you know, I hear that story time and time again, people switching Mm. from synthetic to organic and never going back. I never hear it the other way around. Exactly. So, exactly. What 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 keeps driving your passion to learn and to continue being a champion in this field? Why are you so passionate about not just natural farming but natural pest mm-hmm. management? Yeah. Well, you know, I've always been kind of one of those bleeding heart liberals. I love the plants. I'm an old <laughs> tree hugger, and uh, the flowers and every little bit of things in the garden. And so I've always wanted to just nurture that, and I want to see other people nurture that. And when you see really toxic practices going. And not to mention the problems that go along with the toxic practices. And mm. you kind of really want to educate people. And, you know, when I wasn't in uh, horticulture, I was in nursing. I was uh, not a nurse, a uh, registered nurse, but a, a CNA, which is the person who actually does the patient care. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I really get into nurturing and caring for. And that's kind of the extends to the garden. Oh, that's uh, sweet. And you just kind of can't help yourself but wanting to nurture care and spread, you know, how you can do this and how you can make your life a little less stressful. Yeah. And I think that's the big (laughs) secret, right? That's what Joshua Rutherford, you know, he came on the show and said, when you switch from this idea of killing 
everything, you know, killing the stuff you don't want and instead thriving, you know, making the micro microbiology thrive. And, and that's really, it's easier on you and it comes out in a better product. So I think, I think there really is something to this. I think it came, you know, back in the old days, uh, you know, when nobody knew what was going on, they just figured if you see a bug, kill it. Right. You know, they didn't care. They didn't grasp that a lot of the bugs were really important beneficials. You know, the overuse of antibiotics and and what it's doing to our our resistance. You know, in our own bodies and things because antibiotic soap, antibiotic shampoo, antibiotic antibiotic. You know, keep on sanitizing your hands. And well, right now with the coronavirus going around, yeah, I would go for that. But on a daily <laughs> basis. You kind of need a certain amount of dirt and things in your life in order to have an immune system. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so important to yeah, get in the that sterility. Soil. Sterility yeah. isn't really health. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> no, Mary Beth, you're touching on something that's that's deeper than you know because yeah. this is reflected in both the garden and in human health, you know. Yes. I always draw yes. this relationship to between the um, soil food web and the rhizosphere. It's very similar to the human microbiome when it comes oh, to exactly. when it comes exactly. to the need for diversity, when it comes to yeah. not quelling that biology with outside toxins. Like there's really <laughs> yeah. a there's really a lot that plays into it. And then of course the end result, which is organic farming, you really see different expressions. You see healthier plants, you see so many different things. Just like a healthy microbiome, you're gonna see a healthier person. And so, yeah, you're really I would say yeah. By extension, when you get the healthier plants, you get the healthier people to, or and animals to go and with. And then it the actual connection, consuming. exactly, exactly. It's, it's literally, <laughs> the connection between the two, which is eating the organic yes. food, and yeah, you're 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 right there with me. So, so mm-hmm. I wanted to dive into a few specific subjects today, and the first one I'm so excited to talk about because it's one of your areas of specialties. When we talk hey. to these natural farmers, when we talk to your yeah. peers, microbes come up all the time, and yeah. I think that we listeners understand the basics of the soil food web. You know, there's nutrients in the soil. There's mm-hmm. there's chicken poop in the soil, which has nitrogen, and the plant needs mm-hmm. that nitrogen. Mm-hmm. But there's all these other things going on, and microbes play a huge role. Can you kind yeah. of give my listeners an overview of what role they play and why it's so important to keep them thriving? Well, the microbes are what should be feeding your plants. You know, if you don't want junky plants that are fed by you from synthetic nutrients, you want plants that are healthy enough to feed themselves with the uh, microbes that are kept healthy by you not killing them and not putting toxic chemicals and synthetic fertilizers and a bunch of, you know, salts and things that will kill them. Mm. You want to keep that biology going and they will feed the plant for you and you need to do nothing but harvest and plant. (laughs) <laughs> which is the ideal. And wow. uh, if your soil is uh, kept, if your microbes and all are kept healthy enough, you will have a soil texture more like a, a sponge that holds water and holds microbes and holds nutrients and doesn't uh, leach them out when it rains a lot. Like, wow. for instance, a lot of the no-till uh, farmers have discovered after time when they get a nice uh, fungal colony going because they're not tilling it up every year anymore and they have the earthworms and all their soil gets so sponge like that even when they have flooding uh, rains their fields remain uh, relatively well drained and they're able to drive on them the next day without sinking into the mud whereas their neighbor's farms just become lakes that are they remain lakes for a long period of time before that finally ever drains That's away incredible. because their soils are like clay in comparison. And they're right next door. The farms are right next to each other. But it's and just the, the agricultural that, practices that differ. Exactly. Whoa. Yes. Yeah. Because once they go no till, you know, they find out what happens when they begin to build soil as opposed to destroying soil Whoa. every time that they pass over <laughs> yet another thing to shop up the, I mean, can you imagine you're, you're living in this town and each and every year, at least once or twice a year, somebody drives over and completely upturns your entire society <laughs> well, and you've got to point. start over from scratch every time and your whole society is just going what the hell just happened to us you know wow. and it literally is what's happening to the fungal and the bacteria community the fungal recovers really quickly they don't i mean excuse me the bacteria recovers really quickly they don't get as damaged as the fungal but the fungal i mean when you're doing this year after year especially a lot of people like to till several times a year well wow. and this fungus has no chance and the soil just gets more and more compacted more like just a caramel 
Do you know what I'm talking about? Sure. The candy, a solid, just thick thing that non-absorbent. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The compaction that happens too, with every pass of the tractor, it well, just gets worse. And they get concrete soil at the base of that down just at the base of your, uh, whatever you're plowing with just at that depth, it's concrete. Mm -hmm. So are the no, microbes the go-betweens between the fungus, the nutrients and the plants and the roots? Are they kind of the couriers? Well, the, the nutrients, you know, that's where it's all at. Everybody wants the nutrients. And what the, the plants like to do is they trade with the uh, microbes. You know, I've got this, you've got that. I'll trade you my sugar for your iron. I'll trade <laughs> you my starch for your potassium. Wow. You know, and it, it's just like that. And they do it in three seconds time. It's as simple as that. And uh, if you have the worst soil on earth, you still have enough to grow every plant so long as you've got that mycorrhizal fungus thriving in there. Wow. You've got to have your mycorrhizal fungus. Mycorrhizal fungus can be confusing to people because it doesn't show like an ectomycorrhizal fungus comes up with a mushroom. But the endomycorrhizal fungus doesn't come up with a mushroom. It just grows inside the roots. So you can't necessarily see it in your soil, but you mm. might see that your roots look happier and healthier because they will be if you have the uh, endomycorrhizal fungi. Most plants prefer endomycorrhizal fungi, but there are some that prefer ectomycorrhizal. Some will do both. Coffee probably also likes both. Wow. Um, but I wouldn't grow anything without the mycorrhizal fungus in the ground. It's just such an essential part of the soil biology. But also, you don't want to go strictly with it, uh, mycorrhizal fungi. You, uh, so a lot of saprophytic fungi are extremely beneficial in the soil and helping to break things down and release nutrients and to make a protective barrier around roots that oh. uh, little nasty bugs can't even get through to find the roots. <laughs> you know, which wow. is a lot of what you see in the Bokashi things. They have that kind of fungus growing that really breaks down the organic matter quickly. And it's such a thick mat. A lot of little pests can't even get through it to get to your roots. So it's very protective. Wow. So, so it's actually a defense mechanism as well. It seems yeah. like there's a little lot. Castle. It seems like there's a lot yeah. that we tried to replace by just adding oh, a bottle yeah. of nutrients and oh, yeah. kind of shooting ourselves in the foot there. Is it, is it fair to say that if your soil is thriving and you have lots of inputs in your soil and you have the microbiology, the plant just takes what it needs as opposed to having to play chemist exactly. and adding too exactly. much is going to fry it and adding too little exactly. is going to... So it's more of a let the microbes in the plant determine what it needs rather yeah, than playing give it God. some control of mm. its own life i mean imagine if it was you and you were being forced to fight at somebody else's schedule oh, interesting you know i wouldn't really like that i would want to eat what i want when i want it and not just well this person's here now with the whatever so i guess that's what i have to have <laughs> right. it's like uh. and i also think about the analogy of uh junk food compared or uh you know, I would say junk food for plants is what I call the synthetic <laughs> uh, kind of diet that that the old uh, post World War diet um, compared to a, a healthy diet of the uh, you know right. organic farming manures and all that sort of thing. It's the difference between you know people will look at one and say, well, my plant, look at how fast it grew, mm -hmm. look at how big it is. It's just like saying somebody on methamphetamines is healthy because they're bouncing off the wall <laughs> right. compared to the guy who just took vitamins. You. Yeah, you gave your you gave your kid vitamins and all he does is sit in the chair. You gave your other kid methamphetamine and he's bouncing off the wall. Which Highly one's accurate. healthier? He's vigorous. <laughs> Must be the guy who's bouncing off the wall. He, so, you don't okay. have to feed him. He never quits. You know, you think that's health? And uh, right. that's kind of the analogy I use with the synthetic chemicals because, yeah, it sure looks like health initially, but then wait till the pests find out you're there. Oh, my God, do they love you? Are they? You've got big buds. You've got big flowers. You've got big plants. You've got big pests. I'm <laughs> <come a> running. <laughs> do you see a, a massive difference in health and vigor when plants are – I know especially I've heard – multi-generational cultivated in natural practices mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. they have better genetic expressions they tend to be stronger mm -hmm. and even more pest resistant do you think that's a fair yes. statement 
Yes, because the more you're improving the soil, the less chance you're going to get any kind of pest and disease. The more you're improving your soil, the more oxygen rich it's going to be. And the pathogens and the bugs that are no good for you, they thrive in oxygen poor soils. So mm. the more, less oxygen you have in your soil environment, the more likely you are to have pathogenic or, you know, I, like I told you before, I think they're no longer the fungi category. They're called umycets, but they are the ones that we, you know, the phytophthora, the verticillium, the uh, fusarium, well, those kind of things. The ones we the don't ones want. That, yeah, the terrible things that happen to your plants. And, um, and that comes from not enough oxygen. Not enough oxygen in the soil because mm. they really thrive in oxygen poor conditions. So that that contributes to what you were saying before with the tilling, no microbiology, yeah. compacting, compacting, yeah. compacting. There's no aeration. There's no activity in there. It's stagnant. No, yeah, exactly. Everything gets so compacted that air can no longer penetrate. You're lucky if the water penetrates. And wow. you know, when you do penetration tests side by side, like with the soil from the crappy farm next to the soil uh, of the no-till farm who's been building up the soil, you know, the no-till farm, the, the water gets absorbed and what does leak through comes out clean doesn't come out dirty right. and, and the uh the i want to call it the caramel <laughs> soil <laughs> it's just impenetrable you, the water just sits on top and it takes forever to even get a little ways into the uh, soil at all it's just ugh, it's terrible when, when you do get rain you don't get much penetration right you're not getting much out of that rain and so you, they get so much runoff they get so much erosion well this isn't happening on the no-till farms it's fascinating that microorganisms, you know, microscopic little beings can affect so drastically the runoff the capabilities. World. Yeah, the whole world. That's exactly <laughs> the right. World. Well, think about the ocean and the plankton. They're really controlling us with the uh, oxygen, the acid levels in the ocean. It's all mm. very connected and it's all very weird because it all really does hinge on the microscopic stuff or the really yeah. tiny stuff and stuff you don't think of. and. Yeah, that's you remember really that line. They, you know, the meek shall inherit the earth. I think they meant the microbes. <laughs> <laughs> you might be right about that. You might be right about that, no doubt. Yeah, um, and I you, so. your work is really cool because you like to observe microbiology and the different things that affect it. Like I know for a fact yeah, you, you like do. to take a look at compost teas and then observe the microbiology before yeah. and after things like natural yeah. pesticides and see how these pesticides might affect the microbial yeah. life. Is this just what you do for fun? <laughs> no, no. Well, I got involved with the people at Dr. Symes because the owner uh, of the store used to uh, own the nursery where I work. And um, when she uh, sold it, she when she began to develop the zymes, she asked me to do beta testing for her. So I got involved with that. And I did notice through my experiments there that I could continue using my compost and my compost tea and still do weekly springs with the Dr. Symes. And I wasn't getting a big reduction in my beneficial biology at all, although I was getting a reduction in my pest problem. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Shout out to the amazing Dr. Zymes. Any gardeners who are yeah. who are listening, the yeah. amazing Dr. Zymes is an enzyme pest control product, so it doesn't mm -hmm. have any chemicals no and it leaves residues. no residues. Right. Th these are these are small little enzyme molecules that eat away at the unwanted pests and then mm -hmm. what? Just disappear? Just go away? It, evaporate? It would be, yeah, basically just evaporates very quickly. Whoa. No. I was thinking about the coffee rust disease because it seems like that's one of the worst problems that follows coffee everywhere it goes around the world. And mm -hmm. that if you're really, you know, a good farmer and you're doing constant monitoring that you maybe wouldn't have to spray your entire orchard every week but maybe if you kept up with that you could spray individual plants as you notice them showing symptoms of that and keep it from taking over your orchards because anytime it rains i guess it's really a problem for coffee growers because mm -hmm. that particular fungus is water and windborne and it's just it it really affects the quality of the beans and if it gets bad enough, you know, I guess it could take down the plant, but mostly it just affects the quality of the beans in a very negative way. That's so crazy that the enzyme pest control product can take out like mites and living, mm. but, but then it also fights mm -hmm. fungus. Mm -hmm. Like, how does it know? How well, does it know what to fight? here's the thing. There's like 70,000 or more different enzymes in the world and they all dissolve something. 
Oh, wow. You know, they are, or, or they create some sort of an action right. that uh, makes something happen very quickly that would otherwise have happened over millions of years. <laughs> <laughs> they right. can make it happen in a few seconds. Whoa. And so there are so many different things to dissolve. So there are so many different kinds of enzymes. And depending on which ones you can derive and which ones you can store and how you can store them, you know, you can... Uh, hopefully put out a product such as Dr. Simes, which to me works really, really well as far as carefully taking care of just the things I really want it to target only uh, because it knows the kind of uh, things that that body is made of. In other words, the things that an insect's body is made of is not that different chemically than the things that a small sucking insect's body is made of. Right. And you know, if you have two or three or four different enzymes, they all might be working on a different a part of things and Whoa. that would make that happen so that it got them all and that's why it would kill things at different rates because uh, an older bug for instance is going to have a lot harder shell with more chitin and more uh, of resistance to something Whoa. that such as a really really soft young larvae would be uh, easy to just right it's almost like your stomach acids they're digestive enzymes in there they're digestive acids and it's similar to that where you're basically dissolving whatever is going into your stomach. <laughs> right. With Hopefully. different compounds. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully if you're actually eating food and right. not something else entirely. <laughs> right. No, I know what you but, mean. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. No, that's that's super fascinating though. And I think that listeners may have heard of like nature's miracle. That's another enzyme cleaning product. And it and it acts right. the same way. Well, it's the same principle in that it's using enzymes to dissolve things. And, you know, they have a different, like I say, variety of enzymes. Right. So they might For not like be pest, using the same enzymes and stuff. Yeah. yeah, as Dr. Symes, but they may be using a set that works on things that they want to target in that area. And um, so right. I thought that was interesting. Like there's products like Hygrozyme. I love Hygrozyme, what it does to the roots, but that's a whole different set of enzymes. It's mm. not, you, you can't interchange Right. Hygrozyme and Dr. Zyme right. or anything. They, they wouldn't be effective that way. But so fascinating. Uh, both though, for what they do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Love them. Totally love it. I want to stick on this IPM topic. There's probably a lot yeah. of people listening who have never heard of IPM, stands for Integrated Pest Management. And maybe mm -hmm. you can give us an overview, but but I would say maybe the best way to describe it is doing everything you can to not have yes. a pest problem before yeah. reaching for those harmful sprays. Is that is that a kind of active, yeah. uh, is that yeah. an accurate yeah. assessment? Because in integrated pest management, your last resort would always be some you know toxic thing. Like don't ever go to the DDT until right. you've got nothing else on the shelf at all. But um, yeah, in this case, I'm pretty sure hopefully we're not using DDT anymore, but... It was fabulous once, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that that was the go-to method for lots of farmers. You oh, just spray was. for the pests, but there's all these different controls that you can yeah. that you can implement, right? Can you tell us about some yeah. of the more effective ones you've learned, some of the more interesting pest management strategies? The, well, my best combo that has worked the best for me, because I've tried a lot of things over the years because I'm getting pretty old now. I hate to break it to some of you who've had your eye on me, but I'm way up there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I've tried a few things in my life. And the uh, the thing that's working the best for me now is just having the healthy plants, which I get from the compost and compost tea applications regularly done. And um, that's pretty simple for me to maintain. And I like to do the weekly spring of the Dr. Symes just to be sure that I keep pests away. And it's been the most effective program I have so far. Wow. Now, some people that's just not available in their area everywhere they are. So, so they've got to come up with something else. And my other thing I like to do is I always have uh, predator insects on hand. And I have a lot of uh, like wildflower patches and things around where they can live. If uh, I don't have <laughs> nice. pests in the garden, hopefully they can live on the nectar and pollen in your wildflower patches. So it's always good to have you know, things around like uh, uh, shrubberies, rosemary, sages, mm. uh, you know, just your wildflower package, things that are, will have some flowers, things that have landing pads for insects. They nice. love those. But even the predator insects will keep themselves alive and hang around if they have that, even if there aren't pests otherwise. But once they're, if your garden does have pests, they will be there to be able to come in and help you out <laughs> rather than you having to go and buy some because now you've discovered you have an infestation you don't want 
to do it that way. You don't ever want to be a reactive farm, farmer. You want to be a proactive, preventative farmer. No, no matter what strategizing you're doing, it's always got to be preventative and proactive because reactive just is going to bite you in the back. Yeah, it totally. Got up in your face. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, Mother Nature, you don't want to let her get one step ahead of you. That's definitely uh-uh. the case. Yeah, yeah, no, predator insects, though. I think that's very counterintuitive to a lot of people that, hey, <clears throat> you know, just because this one pest is an insect, you can release a different insect I- into your garden that's going to actually yeah. benefit you and your garden. Yeah, particularly like the predator wasps are really good for so many different pests. Whoa. There's a couple of different predator wasps that are so good for so many different pests. And there are... Uh, the nematodes, I think I talked to you about last uh, time I talked to you, uh, the nematodes that are so beneficial, the predator nematodes, you can spray them both foliar and in the soil. And for instance, I, I was reading about in the coffee in particular, they have a problem with leaf miner sometimes. Mm-hmm. And the only thing that really will get to the leaf miner uh, thing once it's made those mines in the leaves is the predator nematodes. When you spray them foliarly, they can get into those tunnels and they go in and they do the job. Whoa, little hitmen! So, little hitmen! Whoa, that's <laughs> hardcore. <laughs> yeah, that's what they do. Um, that's so fascinating. That, so you're actually applying. You, and for those that's who don't it. know, you're applying these nematodes these organisms when you say foliar you're yes. spraying yes. them on the plant yeah you put them in a watery solution you won't be able to see them without a microscope they're very very tiny as <laughs> well but yeah they're great they're wonderful creatures and they can live for uh, a lot of agitation they can go through sprayers and things without a problem so long as you know you don't here's the thing when split when spraying you don't want to spray like really uh point blankish to your plant, you want to get some distance on, so because the thing is, being shot out of a cannon isn't what kills you; it's when you hit the wall. <laughs> so, but that can actually affect the living. Oh, blow. wow! So you stand soften back, the let them land on it. Let them land gently. Whoa. Yeah, and then they get in there and they'll start mining, or you know, they'll go into the tunnels that the miners have made. That is so. And cool. they'll kill those nasty little things because that's where they want the larvae to be, that's and really you know, cool. that's where the problems start. So. You can do that too. Yeah, that's great. And I know another big part of IPM is things like cover crops and companion plants. Oh, absolutely. B- basically selecting. Oh my gosh, yeah. Don't yeah. ever not do the cover crops. I think I told you I'm religious about that. Uh, <laughs> don't let your soil be naked no matter what. It's so important. Yeah, touch on the importance the of that. The cover crops can do a couple things because particularly like suppose you're growing a crop where you can have uh, an understory of uh, creeping times and uh, rosemary and lavender, things you can walk on, they'll be maintaining the biology in the soil. And at the same time, they'll be hosting uh, your predator insects when you don't have a Mm. pest uh, problem for them to feed on. Little garrison. And yeah, and at the same time, I think that they can really uh, do wonders for your uh, smells, flavors, and aromas because they have such high terpene profiles themselves. And then coffee, you know, that's part of the thing too. <laughs> yeah, that, that's know, what that I hear. You know, the smell of coffee, oh that's my right. God, when you get that berry and you just take a little whiff. <sighs> so incredible. Aromatherapy is real. It's yeah. real. Those molecules are floating around in the nose. Get some, and you do feel better. I mean, don't you always feel better when you're smelling Italian cooking or 100%. a bag of coffee? <laughs> yeah, people don't realize the power of those terpenes in there. Terpenes. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, and, yes. and even the, I think I've brought it up on this show before, the elevated levels of alpha pinene that people who do forest bathing. Absolutely. Yeah, they do the forest bathing and they come back and they say, oh, I feel so great. Well, if you test those oh, people's blood, you. they have elevated oh. terpene levels. It's like, it's like nature in a bottle. I believe it. Well, see, I live up in the woods. So for me, and whenever I have to go down and visit in the city, I can't wait to get back. <laughs> and as soon as you drive into the forest, it's like, I can breathe again. Oh, I can breathe again. I, I remember feel, that, yeah. Oh, the tension goes off of your shoulders. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, That's wonderful. fantastic. Yeah. yeah. You know, I wanted to bring up one thing because this is mm-hmm. a personal question I have, and I know that you'll have a good answer for it. Oh boy. I do I I talk to natural farmers and they tell me about all these new products that that are natural, safe to spray, you know, they fall into two categories a lot of the time. One mm-hmm. is like Dr. Zymes, enzyme pest yeah. control. Yeah. But another one I see a lot is essential oils. And these yeah. essential oils have good pest fighting properties and they're yes. really not 
um, you know, harmful like normal pesticides right. are to the plant. However, right. I do hear things about you don't want to use oil-based sp- sprays because of a plant's stomata, you know, the kind of breathing pores on the plant. Is that a real thing? What do you think about oil-based pest control? What are your thoughts well, on that? It, yeah, because well, it depends on how often you're spraying. Because the thing with the oil-based is they're, they're known to evaporate, but not until about five to ten days after being on the plant. So that oh, means wow. all the while they've been sitting there kind of clogging your stomata. I mean, if you look at a close-up of a stomata there, it's a tiny little thing. It doesn't take much to clog that mm. up, you know. And a lot of the purpose of the oils, it's not just to destroy their body, but it's also to smother them. So, I mean, an oil will always have a certain smothering property. and Which probably makes it pretty effective. It, it is effective. Yeah. I do agree that they can be very effective. They are um, miraculous, but uh, they do have that re- reduction in the photosynthetic. And also, I feel like when the oils are on there, they're kind of more attractive to dust and things. And that's also reducing. Interesting. But, you know, this is minute amount. It's really, but it is, you know, that much potential. Like when I was studying horticulture in college, they would say, you, know, you don't even want dust on your greenhouse because of the reduction in photosynthetic. And you figure that can't be that huge, but it's enough that it reduces yield over time. Wow. And if you're a huge farmer, I get yield over time matters. But, you know, you and me in the backyard, it's not as big of a deal. True. But still but, a fascinating um, If topic. you're spraying once a week... If you're spraying weekly and the stuff doesn't evaporate for 10 days, it's really you don't have any period of time where you're free of it on the plant. If you're spraying once a month, maybe, but I always kind of recommend weekly spraying because I really don't want any pest to get a chance to establish before it's getting hit and knocked down. Right. So it's not something you want to use full time? Mm, Me personally, no. (laughs) <laughs> but I do know that some people, like I say, don't have access to the Dr. Symes. They might try other things. I would try to rely on my predator bugs more. Ah, <laughs> nice. You know, and um, in a desperate situation, I might go with uh, uh, some dilution of hydrogen peroxide probably. Mm. Just because I really, I've had bad experiences with oils before. I've had bad phototoxicity and i live in an area that's really hot and Uh, not everybody lives in a cool area if you're down in a cool area you're going to have a lot better luck with those products than if you live in an area where the growing season (laughs) gets easily into 90 100 degrees you know you've done it all man you've you've got you've got the answers i love that i I have a i have a final wrap-up question and i ask it regularly is this really applicable you, you have so many great natural farming practices. You have all these great mm-hmm. IPM practices. But if you were to go to farmers and say, use mm-hmm. this, is, I guess what I'm saying is, is the only thing stopping people from doing this, the lack of knowledge? Is it really applicable on a large scale? I think so, because anybody can plant a cover crop and, you know, apply a mycorrhiza. And uh, anybody, it's it's something that you don't have to do it over and over and over again. You plant your if you have it like a permanent cover crop, such as thyme, mm. uh, you can mow that down. You don't have to take the roots out, and it just keeps growing back. And mm. it's a it's a perennial, and uh, you can have uh, your mycorrhizae in the soil. You don't necessarily have to keep reapplying and reapplying, so long as you're not tilling. You're probably still uh, ha- going to have that in your soil. Mm-hmm. You know, and certain other biological uh, beneficial bacteria and things that you might want to apply, those don't necessarily have to be reapplied over and over and over. Sometimes once or twice a year is enough. So it's not a huge change a lot of the time to start integrating these natural practices into your yeah. farm. Yeah, yeah, and in, and with anything, you want to start gradually. You know, you don't uh, do it all at once because it can be overwhelming. Yes. You know, first That's thing you point. do is sell your tilling equipment. And then <laughs> and the next thing you do is quit fertilizing. And then, you know, <laughs> step by step, step by step. Oh, man. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. yeah. And that is that is the answer I'm getting. You know, Chris Trump has talked about his yeah. neighboring farm switching to his style of farming because it's, you know, increasing his productivity. Yes. So it's like, oh, yeah. I'm glad to hear it from multiple people. I hope that it is, in fact, getting bigger. And I appreciate, you know, people like you coming on my show. People love to hear this stuff, Mary Beth. You're really, Yay. you're really deep in it, and like, I get great reviews on your episodes. So I'm oh, sure, I'm you. sure my listeners will be giving you a follow after this one as well. Um, thank you, Jordan. Yeah, totally. You get good reviews from me too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. You're awesome. What, what else can thank we say you. before we sign off here? Uh, any final words on natural farming or pest control or um, microbes or anything? Organic, 
organic coffee is the best, shade grown, <laughs> Arabica, you know, bird friendly. That's uh, tick all my boxes, and I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, and, love it. Uh, we'll get you some purity. Yeah. I'll ship you out some coffee. Oh, sweet honey. There will be no complaint. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, one more time, everyone. Follow Mary Beth on Instagram at MBSIPM. Give her a follow. See her lovely Thank garden you. and her all her interesting scientific posts about microbiology and pest control. You will not regret it. Uh, uh-huh. Mary Beth, thank you. Thank you so much for taking thank the time. Thank you, George. I thank love you talking so to you. Much again. All right. Now, if You're I remember great. correctly. Have a good afternoon. Yeah, you, you kind of <laughs> hop off beforehand during the show, so we're going to let you go. I appreciate you, <laughs> and uh, I like how you do it. It's the, it's the unique style. You got places to be, so oh, um, take care of yourself, and, and please follow up. I will get you some Purity Coffee. We will talk soon, and, and best oh, of luck sweet. to you, Mary Beth. Godspeed. Thank speed. you, Jordan. God bless. All Bye-bye. right. Take care. Bye, Mary Beth. What a wonderful guest. I love speaking to Mary Beth Sanchez. Thank all you listeners so much for tuning in today. I appreciate you all. We'll see you next time on the Coffee Health and Science Podcast. Mm-hmm.